Let's go to let's go to Revelation uh, 15. We're in the seven bowls. I guess you're in seven dishes. We're in. I, I tried, Fran. Um, here we are. In 15, we're going to read eight verses. Uh, yeah, we'll do eight verses on it. Um, Now we've got, at the top of your paper, we've got, we're, we're to study on three sets of divine judgment of the tribulation out of Daniel 9.27. That's where it comes from. We got the seven bowl, we got the seven seals, we got the seven trumpets, and we got the seven bowls. And I listed where they're found in the scriptures, right? At the top of your paper. Okay? Now, like the seventh seal, when you got to the seventh seal, it opened the, tru the seven trumpets. When you get to the seventh trumpet, it opened the seven bowls. Agreed? Okay. And so, <clears throat> verse 15 is uh, an interlude in the seventh trumpet announcing the seven bowls. And that's where we are tonight in Revelation 15, 1 through 8. And he begins, And I saw another sign in heaven. The girls got you up here if you want to come. Come on. <laughs> They're, uh, she's got to get a cup of coffee. You just, you wander on back up here. It'll be all right. I saw another sign in heaven. Let me tell you why that's important. We've had we've had six uh, we've had seven seals. We've had seven trumpets. How many is that? Fourteen. fourteen. So we've had fourteen signs, and we're about to get seven more. First Corinthians one twenty one, twenty two. Tell us what sign, who are the signs for? Jews. Jews, not Gentiles. Jews. They're for Jews. They're for the Jewish age. These are signs for the tribulation for the Jews. Okay? When we get through with all this, we're going to have 21 of them. And they're going to be ones you cannot miss. Right? We've already covered 14 of them. And so we've still got seven more to go. Okay, so he says, I saw another sign in heaven. And he's about to introduce the seven bulls. Great and marvelous, seven angels who had the seven plagues, which are the last. They are the last because in them the raft of God is finished. And I saw as it were a sea of glass mixed with fire and those who had come off victorious from the beast that's the antichrist and from the image and from the number of his name you know that's 666 standing on the sea of glass holding harps of God and they sang the song of Moses and of God and of the song of the lamb so they're going to they introduce with two songs and there it is, verse 3 and 4, a song, okay? After these things I looked, and the temple of the tabernacle of testimony, we call that the Ark of the Covenant, in heaven was opened, in other words, the, the, the temple and the holies of holies, in heaven was opened, and the seventh angel who had the seven uh, plagues came out of the temple, clothed in linen clean and bright, girded about their breast with golden girdles and one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels the seven bowls the golden bowls full of the raft of God who lives forever and ever and the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power and no one 
was able to enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. So we find that word a couple times in there. Then, uh, then chapter 16 is going to list the bowls. We'll go through them. He's going to list all the bowls in chapter 16. Then we're going to have an interlude in 17, an interlude in 18. Um, then we enter into 19. Uh, the first half of the book is four hallelujahs and the marriage supper of the Lamb. The we I think it's the wedding supper, the wedding supper. And then you're going to have the second coming of Christ. The last half of verse 19 is the second coming of Christ on the white horse, yada, yada. Okay? So let's have a word of prayer. We'll get into this one, the seven bowls. Uh, notice on your paper up there where it says uh, Revelation 15. Uh, see the word last? I put it in, in bold print. There's a definite article. That's the T-A-S means that's the word the in Greek. And eschatos, that's where you get eschatology, the study of the last days. That's where you get that. Okay. Um, so that gets us. Uh, let me, let me, uh, well, let me, let's have a word of prayer and then I'll get into the bowls. Okay. This is a moment for classroom etiquette. It's a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. The importance of studying and getting divine revelation, enlightenment in your soul, is that it has to be done through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. What would prevent that is carnality. Identity of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude sins. It could be sins of the tongue. It could be overt sins. What do I need to do? I need to confess them. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that puts us back into fellowship of verse 1 John 1, 5. That puts us back there because of the propitious work of Christ in 1 John 1, 7. This is not, 1 John 1, 9 is not a passage for salvation, but it is a passage for sanctification in the believer's life. In other words, the work of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. This is especially true for Bible study. So I give you a moment within your priesthood of 2 Peter 2 to deal with that and pray that God would teach you important things tonight from the Word. As I've said to these that are in our study, I say to you that are home studying with us, this applies to you as well. Turn off, get, a, get, a, get away from anything that would distract you or cause you to stop in the middle of this study and be distracted. This is your responsibility as a priest. Father, we're thankful. We pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of this study tonight, bring the relevance to our life in it, not just the relevance that we won't go through it as we have declared over and over, but that we could learn something from it. If nothing else, the urgency to preach the gospel because nobody wants to go through this. And if they're saved before the tribulation comes, they will be raptured. If not, they'll go through it. And uh, they've never seen anything like this ever on the earth. Ever, 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 ever. So we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I want to show you something that's kind of interesting. Uh, in verse uh, 17, chapter verse 1, it says, And one of the seven angels that had the seven bowls. Do you see that? See that? Chapter 17, verse 1. I want to show you something. Now, I, I close this out with the second coming of Christ and the battle of Armageddon. I close this out. I've closed this seventh bowl out in the 19th chapter, verse 21. But this angel with the seven bowls, I want to show you something. He is, he is found again in chapter 21. So I want you to look over chapter 21 of Revelation. If you have a study Bible, notice the heading. The new heaven and new earth. And, in, and, and look at verse 9. 
and one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls. There he is. He's, he's over there working. Then he's also identified again in verse 15. The one who spoke with me. Now we're in chapter 21 and 22. We're in uh, chapter 20. Chapter 20, we're in the great white throne judgment. And then in 21 and 22, we're in the new Jerusalem. We still have this angel, but, uh, but of course, the, bowl, the bowls are over. But this angel is still working off from that seventh bowl. That's just, I'm just telling you that's interesting, okay? Uh, I'm just telling you that's interesting. Uh, one of the angels with the seven bowls. The seven bowls is the last divine judgment of the tribulation upon the world. Uh, Revelation 11, 1. This is, right, he said the last, right, of the wrath of God is finished. Um, this is also the third woe. You remember the three woes judgment? This is the third woe of the tribulation. If you probably don't remember, but the three woes came with the fifth, sixth, and seventh judgment, a uh, trumpet, right? First woe. Well, look, in Revelation 8, 13, we have the three rows, woes identified with the fourth trumpet. Uh, and then with the fifth, sixth, and seventh trumpets, we got the first woe done, the second woe, and the third one is to come. But the third one doesn't come in the trumpets. Uh, the third one is going to be the seven bowls. Do you understand that? Okay, that's kind of important. I put all the places for you to study, right? I gave all that to you up there. It's, you know, you'll have to study on your own with it. Um, all, almost all students of the Bible theologically of uh, eschatology, see, this occurs in the last three and a half years. And a lot of stuff has occurred in the last three years. We're at the last of the last three and a half years because the trumpets came in, right? I mean, we've been under this stuff. Trumpet four, trumpet uh, five, six, and seven were all into the last three and a half years plus the seven bowls. By the time we get to the seven bowls, we've been through the seven trumpets. Now it's over. So we know. And so the way this thing is laid out, when, when you look at it, this all is going to occur in one chapter, which is unusual. I mean, chapter 16 covers all the bowls. So putting all that together, we, we, we believe that these six bowls are going to come in fat and quick successions. In fact, many think they'll be within days or, or simple weeks. Not many weeks either. They think they'll either come in, in, in consecutive days right down the pike or in very short weeks. Because there's not a lot of time left. And the way they're laid out, they're laid out very quickly. You got one, two, three, four, five. I mean, they were, and they, you get that when you start reading it, you go like, whoa, 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 it's moving pretty fast here. And, and so most people understand that, you know, we're not talking about long periods here. We're talking about really quick stuff happening. So here's the first bowl. The first bowl, the first bowl of judgment is in verse 2. It's, and it's identical, and this is in um, the 16th chapter, course, verse 2. And you will see that skin disease, an incurable skin disease is going to hit him in verse 2. First angel went out, and watch for this. Watch, just because we're at the last of this, watch out. The angel is going, this is going to be consistent. He's going to pour out the raft of God, but, right? We're into the raft of God judgments now. We're, we're in... I mean, the, we're at the last, and he's pouring them out. And, and it's interesting that every time it's going to say he poured out something. And um, no matter what it is, it's the raft of God. And, and later you're going to hear that it's the raft of the almighty God. Okay? So, and each one, see, like the first angel, he pours out. He pours out his bowl into the earth. And it became loathsome and malignant sores the incur incurable sores upon men who had the mark of the beast and worshipped him. See? Right? That's the 666 deal. All right? So there's the first one. All right? 
Then the second bowl in verse 3, uh, the second angel poured out on, uh, onto the sea. It became blood like that of a dead man, and every li living thing in the sea died. Okay? So he's, he's hit the seas. Okay? So we got that. E every li Now, the last time we had a third of it, right? Now everything, everything's gone. Um, and then the third bowl, uh, verse 4 through 7, is kind of, it's a little longer. Um, the third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and the springs of water. Remember, we've seen that before, but only a portion of it was hit. Now they're gone. And he's going to pollute them. But notice how it's identified. And the springs of water, and they become blood. And I heard the angel of the water saying, and watch, there's a, a moment here of praise. There, there's a moment. Uh, they, there's a moment of praise. Listen to what they say. The angel of the water is saying, Righteous art thou who art and was, O holy one, because thou didst judge these things. For they poured out the blood of saints, for they poured out the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink. They deserve it. And I heard the altar saying, Yes, O Lord God, the almighty, true, and righteous are thy judgments. See, that's a, that's a, that's a praise moment. That's a, the, these judgments are going to be so bad, but they're so righteous. That interesting, and so that's kind of unique. We've not had that before like that, but we're going to get used to it uh, in the seventh bowls. And so we have all the waters polluted. The drink, these, are, this is drinking water that's been polluted, natural drinking water, uh, because because of the blood of martyrs. And then we have this special this special phrase of praise of the righteousness and of the judgments of God. And then we have the fourth bowl, uh, verses 8 and 9. And the fourth angel poured out his bowl upon the sun. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? I mean, that's a big bowl. Upon the sun. And it was... It, and it was given to it to scorch men with fire. And the men were scorched with fierce heat. And they blasphemed the name of God who has the power over these plagues. And they did not repent so as to give him glory. That is, I mean, they could, for, for these people, they could get this turned around. Right? There's an appeal. Right? All you got to do. And the fifth angel poured out the bowl upon the throne of the beast. That's the dictator of the revived Roman Empire. We call him the Antichrist. And his kingdom, darkness. N notice, now this is one of the few times when you have something that's um, geographically local. But everything else has been poured out upon everything. Get something really neat, neat and different here. Um, and uh, the throne and his kingdom became darkened and they gnawed their tongue because of pain and they blaspheme the God of heaven because of their pain and their sores and they did not repent of their deeds. So the sixth angel poured out his bowl upon the great river Euphrates and its water was dried up so that the way might be prepared for the kings from the east. Now we're talking Armageddon set up. That's the Armageddon set up in chapter 19. Verse 13. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast, that's the Antichrist, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, that's the dictator of Palestine, three unclean spirits like frogs. For they are spirits of demons performing signs, which go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them together for the war of the great day of God, the Almighty. Verse 15, we have another blessing, another praise. Behold, I am coming like a thief. 
You ever heard that before? All over the New Testament, Jesus taught this all the time. Like, and I put it on your paper somewhere, like Matthew 24, uh, somewhere, somewhere Matthew 24. And then he says, blessed, and, and, then, and then there's another phrase that comes out of Luke 12. Blessed is the one who stays awake and keep his garments, lest he walk about naked and then men see his shame. Uh, be ready for his coming. See, that, and I gave you a passage in Luke where that was taught. And they gathered them together to the place which in Hebrew is called the mountain Megiddon. See, ha is the Greek word for mountain. That har, H-A-R. And so when you have Armageddon, what they do is they leave off the H. But the true, true Armageddon is ha Megiddon. It's the mountain of Megiddon. Okay? So... Now we get to the seventh bowl in verse 17. Agreed? Seventh bowl. Let's say I went through the sixth bowl really quick, didn't I? I didn't turn my page. Let me see if I missed. I didn't miss anything. I had it anyhow. All right. Seventh bowl in verse 17 through 21. See how quick this is going? See, and everybody goes like, blah, 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 blah. Right? Just, and so everybody understands we're at the end of this thing, and, and it, it's he just pouring it on them. And that's what, pour, that's what it really means to be poured out upon. He's just pouring it on them. You know, we say, boy, Alabama really poured it on them, you know, like the last ball game. So that, that's kind of the thing we got, and that helps us in our mind kind of get a setting on it. The seventh angel poured out his bowl upon the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne saying, it is done. We're at, the, we're at the end of this thing, right? Seventh bowl. I mean, this is it. And, and there were flashes of light. See, we're in chapter 17, and then we're going to have interludes. Um, that it's done. And there were flashes of lightning sounds and pearls of thunder, and there was great earthquake. Now watch, he describes this earthquake. This is a great earthquake. Now we've had other earthquakes. This this. When, when God says it's a great one, watch out. And then he describes it. He says, such as there has not been since man came to be upon the earth. Holy mackerel. So great an earthquake was it and so mightily. Mighty. And the great city, that, that's Jerusalem, was split into three parts. And, and we know about this. You know, Ezekiel is going to talk about this. And that, that's going to be, that's going to set up, when that occurs at the second coming of Christ, that's going to set up the millennium. And, you know, we'll talk, I'm going to do studies on this, so we'll talk more about it. And the cities of the nations fell. This, and we're, we're talking about all the, all the major cities. I mean, every capital went down, every major city. And, you know, that would, let, let's say in Alabama, that would be Birmingham, Huntsville, Montgomery, Mobile, probably Dothan. No, I don't. <laughs> Just to, trying to get, trying to include Shirley in this. Uh, and Babylon the Great was was remembered before God to give her the cup to give her the cup of the wine of His fierce wrath. And we're. And I think it's 18, he's going to talk about that. 17, 18, he's going to talk about this Babylon. This is that revived Roman Empire. And, and, and what, the, what Babylon, the reason Babylon is described this way, it's going to be Ro, the revived Roman Empire. But what way is described that way? Because it was both a political and a religious machine. Well, now the separation of church and state business. Um, well, anyway, where was I? Anybody know where I stopped? And at, oh, verse 20, watch this now. We had a little bit of this before, now, now they're gone. And every island fled away and every mountain was not found. Do not move to Puerto Rico. <laughs> Don't buy no real estate down there. I mean, every island. <laughs> well, they got, they got a lot of cleaning up to do, haven't they? But the, and the mountains were not found. Wow. 
Now watch this. Huge hailstones, about 100 pounds, 100 pounds each, fell from heaven upon men. That'd, that'd knock you a little crazy, wouldn't it, Ray? That was smart. You wasn't want that smart? Either my junior or senior year, we had a terrible hailstorm in Michigan, the somewhere about the size of a baseball. It it destroyed. I mean, it. You would have thought a bomb hit. It tore up all of our windows, our roof at our home. I mean, it devastated our house. I don't know how much a baseball weigh. How much a baseball weigh? I don't know much, though, right? I mean, you can give it to a little kid and you throw it and break a window. At least Ben, ben can. Keep in mind, it's coming from heaven. So well, yeah, 100 pounds. <laughs> I'm not an engineer, but I know it weighs a lot more when it hit me. What was that car? That semi-truck. And listen. And men blaspheme God because of the plague of the hail, because its plague was extremely severe. No kidding. 100 pound chunk of ice? I guess so. Listen. That's... And so you have chapter 17, chapter 18, before you get to the second coming of Christ. And you have the first half of verse 19. So we, I call them interludes. They're still part of what's going on. But I call them interludes because they're kind of unique and different. For example, in chapter 17, uh, I introduced you to the, one of the angels that had the seven bowls. And in 17, you, you have what's called the mystery of the woman. She's referred to as the great har harlot. And, and that's the revived Roman Empire on the seven hills business. And... Uh, and and she's that because she's both corrupt in in the sense of religion and corrupt in the sense of politics. And um, and 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 um, verses in the now pay attention to this now. But in chapter seventeen, one through seven, he talks about the mystery of the woman. But listen to me, what he does in verses eight. Through 18, he explains it. So don't miss that. Put that on your paper someplace so that you can go back and study this because he gives you this mystery and then he interprets it. You know, kind of like Jesus, when he does par certain parables, he would come back and explain it because people weren't getting it. He would come back and interpret that. And so... What you have is 7, 1 through 7, he gives you the mystery of the woman. And then in verses 8 through 18, he gives you an interpretation of it. So that's very important. Now, what you want to look for, and, and listen, and he's going to, um, you, you want to look for the Antichrist is described in chapter 17 as who once was, now is not, and yet will come. Okay, and if you if you want a good study on your own, go to your concordance in the back of your Bible, or if you have a concordance in your home, and look up the difference between antichrist and antichrises, and you'll get an idea what he's talking about. Because today in the church age, there are antichrises running around, who are being, who are a prototypes of the Antichrist that is to come. So pay attention to that. That's well worth your time to study. Um, and, and listen, um, in 17, look at verses, I want you to go look at 17, look at 13, 14. The rest of this, you just study on your own. Uh, we're going to come back and do special studies off of this after we get through the bowls. And some of this will be explained, but you, you go back and you look at, I mean, you, you can read as well as I can. Um, verse 13, watch this. Uh, 
he's talking about the Antichrist and his, and his kingdom, right, that's gone into darkness and all that business. In verse 13, he says, these have one purpose, <clears throat> talking about <clears throat> the Antichrist and his forces that he has gathered. You know, <clears throat> the other kingdoms that he talked about, the three kingdoms, the ten kings, all that business, ten, the ten federations of whatever. They have one purpose. They have one purpose. They, they, they are of one mind. They have one purpose, and they give their powers and authorities to the beast. <clears throat> and this is what their one purpose is. These will wage war against the lamb, and the lamb will overcome them. So that, that's the one main goal of the Antichrist. That's the one main goal of Satan, isn't it? So if we know, and we do, if you study the New Testament, we know there are Antichrist out there working on the Antichrist's behalf, setting up his kingdom and his work for this day then you know that his one, their one purpose in life is to destroy the lamb, therefore interpreted that is to destroy the church. Agreed? Agreed. Because he's the head of it, and he's the savior of the body of it. And I think sometimes we don't take any of this stuff serious. Oh, well, they, you know, they have their beliefs, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but it's important for you to have yours and to be able to make a stand on it, to be a, make an intelligent argument on behalf of the truth of the word of God. Well, anyhow, that was verse 13 and 14, wasn't it? Okay, well, one purpose, and, and that's an important point for us to walk away from here tonight. Then in chapter 18, if you move over to 18, we have this theme of Babylon. Babylon has fallen. And um, you have another, another one of the seven angels uh, introduced, with, not by name or anything, but to this, and the subject is the fall of Babylon. And interesting enough, uh, Peter does something in First Peter three thirteen. Uh, he refers to the church at Rome as uh, as uh, uh, from Babylon. Isn't that interesting? I mean, he understood this stuff, um, which is kind of interesting. Now, here's what you want to watch for in chapter eighteen. Watch for two phrases, and I wrote them on your paper. They're going to fall in one day, in one hour. They're going to fall in one day, like in verse 8, in one hour, verse 10, 17. That should be 17 and 19 on your paper. I don't know. I got a apostrophe somewhere in a comma or somewhere in there. They're, they're going to, the great Babylon is going to fall in one day, in one hour. Now, what's kind of interesting, because we started in the, we started in the book of Daniel, remember? Da actually, this is, this is Daniel 9.27, uh, out, out of the book of Revelation. But in Daniel, this idea of one day and one hour actually has background to the book of Daniel. In Daniel, the fifth chapter, well worth your read, in Daniel chapter 5, verses 25 through 31, uh, Darius is going to is going to fall in one day, and so that's kind of interesting how it's all all interconnected in history. You say, well, is there any is there any background to that? Yeah, I mean, this this huge kingdom fell in, in one day, uh, but anyhow, one day. So pay attention to one day and one hour, because we know we're there, don't we? When you're down to one day and one hour, we are there, buddy. We are there. And what are we looking for? We're not looking for any more judgment. We're looking for what? The coming of Christ, right? One day, one hour. We're, what are we looking for? What are we looking for? What are we looking for? We're looking for the coming of Christ. All right. Um, there is a, a couple woes. Don't confuse them with the, the big woes that we've been talking about. Uh, woe, woe, woe to the great city. Um, and uh, in her was found the blood of the prophets, the saints, and all who have been slain on the earth. <clears throat> you know what I'm saying? That's, that's this Babylon. That's how she's described. There's another interlude before we get to the second coming of Christ, because now we're down, we're down to the day and the hour, aren't we, where we're looking for the coming of Christ. Because, listen, listen, if Christ doesn't come, 
I mean, this is what we know. If he doesn't come, every, everything is going to perish. There will be nothing left. There will be nothing left if he doesn't come. So it's come quickly business, right? I mean, this is what this is about. So we have an interlude. This interlude, I'm in chapter 19 now. I'm in chapter 19. There's an interlude, verses 1 through 10. And then we're going to have the second coming of Christ. So I find this really interesting. There's this interlude. And what we have is four hallelujahs. Now, we're, we're familiar with hallelujahs in the Old Testament, and we're probably familiar with singing them in the church. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. We're probably familiar with that. <laughs> but, this, but this is the only place you're going to find hallelujah in the New Testament. And, and, and hallelujah means praise the Lord. Um, but, in, in, but, but what you have is a, this magnificent tribute to God. When, now, we've seen it already in preparation for this, haven't we? You know, we've seen twice, we've seen, seen a, 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 in the bold judgment, we've seen a pause and a moment of, of prayer and praise to, to the judgment of God. And a prayer that people would repent. This is serious stuff. And, um, and they're not willing at this point. And so the four hallelujahs come out, and I've laid them out there for you. They're well worth your time and read. All right. I don't want to read through them because all I do is read through them. And um, I want you to read through them and spend a little time with them. Because these are magnificent hallelujahs. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And um, these are... To enter to at least preloads are to introduce the second coming of Christ. These four hallelujahs are introducing the coming. I mean, the choir is out singing, and out comes the heavens open, and out comes this our Lord on a big white horse business. <laughs> I mean, you just can't get, can you get get drama out of that? I mean, can you not see this? I mean, I can picture that in my head for some reason. Um, and uh, and b the choir's going to sing, and there's going to be the married supper of the Lamb and the second coming of Christ. See that? You're going to have the four hallelujahs in verses 1 through 8, and then the wedding supper of the Lamb, which we'll come back and study. All right? I keep telling about how many things I'm going to... I need to start writing these down. How many things... I th I'm thinking this is going to be a short such thing and I'm thinking I keep telling you well we'll come back and talk more about it and that and I see you go like yeah you you better and I know uh well I have one it's called the Holy Spirit and so I depend on him to do a whole lot of things things for me but we, but in verses 9 and 10 we have the and if you have do you have a study bible it probably says the marriage of the lamb doesn't it maybe starts back in verse 7 somewhere like that right right the marriage supper of the Lamb. And so that's verse 9 and 10. Right? And, and so then we have the second coming of Christ. Let, let me, I don't know if I wrote this on your paper. I don't see it on mine, so it's probably not on yours. I would, I, I would suggest you write this on, on your paper at the, at the second coming of Christ. Write down Matthew 24, verses 29 through 31. Uh-huh, 29 through 31. Um, because what Matthew 24 is talking about is what we're talking about here. And so we, we have the second coming of Christ, um, which is a huge event and small compared to this, isn't it? I mean, we've been, we've been chapter 6 to 19, and we got the second coming of Christ in verses 11 through 21. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, the second coming of Christ... Out of heaven came a white horse and a rider. Uh, and and look, look at the names that, that is given to him in his second coming. Look at the names. These are second coming. You know, he had, he had specific names in the first coming, right? He's got specific names in the second coming that, that have as much bearing on the second coming as his other names do on the first coming. We'll call his name Jesus. Why? Save his people from their sins, right? We'll call him Emmanuel. Why? Because he's going to be a hypostatic man. 
under me day in true humanity and one unique person of the universe. And on the, on the names go, he, you know, he's the, he's the savior. He's, he's, I'm the light of the world. You know, all these things that are significantly important to you and I in the first coming. But here are names that are especially important to the second coming of Christ. All right. And so he, he, I, I list them to you so that you could, the first one, uh, faithful and true. He is faithful and true. The, the second one is a name written on him that no one knows except himself. Probably Bubba. Something like that. <laughs> Bubba. Something like that. I, I hope I don't have any trouble getting in after that. Say, so, uh, what did you call him and got a laugh over? Mm, Jesus. No, you didn't. Uh, then uh, the word of God. He's called the word of God. The guy on the horse is called the word of God. And of course, probably the most famous to us is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Right? <laughs> He's got special names attached with him. That are very important from the sec that are attached to the second coming of Christ to the human race. Uh, and then uh, he's got an army with him. The army comes out of heaven. Right? The, I don't know. She said, I, I don't know. She said something in Spanish. No, I said. <laughs> The armies in heaven followed him. Anything to rile Pam up. That's I live for that. Just to rile her up a little bit. Uh, armies in heaven followed him on white horses to wage war. So listen, if you listen, this summer, what should you do for a little activity? Learn how to ride a horse, okay? If you don't know how to ride a horse. Uh, right? I knew there had to be why I like westerns all my life. It had, there had to be something. Tom Mix and Roy Roger and all these guys. Gene Autry. Lash LaRue. Oh, it's all coming back. Oh, gosh, quit, quit. My heart is palpitating. Uh, quit, quit. Look what I started. Listen. Also, one of the famous things is the birds calling to the great feast, right? Vulture in, in uh, Matthew, this is not in your paper, but Matthew 24, 27 says uh, that that day will come and the vultures will be called to dinner. Wherever the corpse is, that's where the vultures will gather. We know about that, don't we? Birds will be called to the great supper of God is called. Uh, passages that would be worth going back and take a look at would be the 14th chapter, verse 20, the 16th chapter, verse 14, the 19th chapter, verse 17. I guess that's where I am. <laughs> but anyhow, the Antichrist, uh, we call him the dictator, revived Roman Empire, just to keep him or keep us oriented uh, to the history, history of what's going to be. And then the false prophet we call the dictator of Palestine, because that's what he will, will represent, will be captured. Before the war begins, a reconnaissance group will go in and capture him. Did you love this? Oh, yeah. oh this, is, this is better than anything you watch on television. Do what? I don't know, I'm missing something. Help me. Oh, <laughs> I guess. Um, they captured him. They captured him and threw him in the lake of fire, 1920. The first ones to go. Then the rest were killed with the sword which came from the mouth of Christ. 
We've seen him do something equivalent to this uh, when he killed 100, uh, 185,000 Assyrians, right? So we know he has this kind of, I mean, he has a, he has a reputation. Um, we'll, you know, I'm just hitting highlights of where the, what is in the passage because we'll do a, a more intense study on the second coming of Christ, of course. And what I've done, I've chosen... As, as soon as the, the, the false prophet and the Antichrist is thrown into the lake of fire, I close the book on him. Because even though, even though really the book really shouldn't be closed on it until we put Satan in the abyss in chapter 20. The reason, and, and that truly is where it ought to go. I didn't want to do it because chapter 20 is widely known uh, for people. They know that what you have in chapter 20 is the millennial age and the great white throne judgment. Then you go into the new. And so I kept that back. I held that back not to get people confused. Okay. But the truth of the matter is the tribulation is about that ungodly trinity of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Right? And this is not wound up until chapter 20 when Satan, it, at the end of the war, Satan is taken a cast into the abyss for the thousand years, then released, right? But uh, as I said, I didn't want to do that, even though I, th I really do believe that, that, whole, holy, that we, don't, we don't have the tribulation complete until that holy, holy, unholy trinity is done with, Right? Until their judgment is completed. And uh, then. Uh, mm. When Satan comes out a thousand years later and causes a revolution, is that to finally prove the perfect environment has never been the answer? Well, it's one of them. Generation, that's it. That's one of them, isn't it? That's it. That's one of them. <laughs> that's sure one of them. Uh, I mean, we're back in the garden. We're right back where we started and we got the same problems. Satan is a bugaboo, ain't he? I mean, he's a bugaboo. Well, anyhow. Anyhow. Uh, but anyhow, what, what I'm really saying to you, to really close out the tribulational period, we've got to take care of these three guys. Are you with me? I don't want you to be confused about that. But because of the, the 20th chapter dealing with the millennium, the great white throne judgment, th there's not much information out of revelation on the millennial age. And yet it's a big deal. A thousand years, Satan's down there and a thousand years up here. It's a big deal, but there's very little information in it. So I didn't want to take away because the only, f the only way you're going to find it in the New Testament uh, here in Revelation is in chapter 20, right? So I held that little piece of information, but I want you to understand until we get these three people off the tribulation judgment of the tribulation is not over until these three bad guys are put are de dealt with are you with me so um, you know uh, that's the reason I, I I I did what I did okay I wanted to close it down 19 because I didn't want it I didn't want us to get too confused but I may have confused it more than I needed to <laughs> but those three those three bugger booze have got to go before the tribulation is over. The, the judgment has to fall upon him, not just upon us, but upon them. So, and that's another reason. And he's not going, he, he's not going to be thrown in lake fire until after the millennium. So I held that. I held that piece back. So, in all, at least for us, we've gone through Revelation 6 through 19 and uh, about, about, about the way the seven bowls have gone with great speed. Uh, we have ended the seven bold judgments of the tribulation with the battle of Armageddon and uh, the, the false prophet and the beast guy, Antichrist, thrown in the pit uh, or thrown in lake of fire. And uh, so I saved the final events, chapter 20, 21 and 22, for the really end of it, of, of it as eschatology. And when we come back... Uh, we will begin to, I want to do a special study with you on the dictator of the revived Roman Empire called the Antichrist. We'll do a special on him. I want to do a special study uh, uh, on uh, the false prophet. And um, 
I don't know. I got several. I'll have to think about them. I haven't wrote them down yet. Um, and and if there if there are if there are certain events that uh, you would like me to cover, there I probably co cover a lot of it with covering different things. But if there are, if you sh pass me a sheet of paper, I'll see if I can't cover some of that. Like I said, probably a lot of it would be covered by just looking at different things. Like we'll cover the millennium, we'll cover the the second coming of Christ in more detail. Um, you know, the married supper of the Lamb. We'll cover that. We'll, we'll cover some of the biggies that are out there. People go like, "What about this? What about that?" I'll cover some of the big stuff, and then uh, if there's anything that I've missed that you would like to know about, why we we can sure do that because. Whew, I don't know the last time I went through eschatology. It's, it's been a long time. And I'll tell you, it's not that I don't think it's interesting. I don't think it's relevant to the church. As a pastor, I, I think you should teach it. And I th it's on the website, and you can certainly pull it down and study it. But the reason I don't do a lot of teaching on the second coming is because as, as a pastor, a practical pastor of a congregation, they've got so many problems that need to be dealt with in their in their life in their families, they've got so many de issues that need to be resolved now. That I feel I feel overwhelmed by that to teach 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 on that. That we can keep our head above water in the church age. Because we're not going to go through any of this. I I know it's I know it's kind of it's kind of wretched. Uh, when you stop to think about what's going to happen, but it is part of the real deal. I know, I know. Yeah, I like yeah, I know. Yeah, but it is part of the deal. So we're going to look at some of the highlights, and we're going to look at some of the things that are important. And um, as John Dyer says, let's get them and let's put them in archives so that people that are left can pull them down and read them and say, oh, this is why you need to get saved. <laughs> so John's thinking ahead with all these tapes. Uh, that we got so so let's close this out with a word of prayer and then we'll have our 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 prayer as a group uh, heavenly father we're thankful today for these that have come to study with us on this subject matter and we do know it's important because the message is salvation and boy the power of evil over people's lives is another message that's seen here. I mean, throwing a hundred pound hail stones out of heaven and it won't cause them. I mean, that's, I mean, I don't even understand that. So I pray today we would understand you won't go through any of this. If you believe that Jesus died for your sins and was buried and raised from the dead the third day. Because the power of salvation is in the gospel to those who believe. Romans 1.16. Because we're saved by grace. Saved by grace through faith. And that not of ourselves is a gift of God, not of works, least any man should boast. So if there's a good reason to get saved is because we don't know when the rapture of the church will come. But when it does, the tribulation will begin. Daniel's 70th week of the ninth chapter, verse 27, will become the reality of life in the world. Not in just one region, the world. Always the phrase, the earth, upon the earth, upon the earth, upon the earth, upon the earth. So I pray, Father, the people that hear us wherever they live would celebrate their salvation through the work of Christ on the cross, burial and resurrection by the power of God. That power lives in us through the Holy Spirit. We need to be people about the Lord's business. We live in treacherous times that are coming. We need to em em encourage people to step out of darkness into the light into salvation, and we need to do it today. In Jesus' name, amen.